Welcome dear students. After having learnt about the anatomy and functions of Eustachian tube, let us now look into various tests done to identify the functionality of Eustachian tube. So these are called as Eustachian tube function tests. Basically what we are going to check is if the tube is able to open and close when necessary and perform its functions of ventilating the middle ear. We have various tests to understand this. First and most important among all of this is called as Valsalva test. Valsalva test. Here we are using this as a test but it is actually a manure also. Valsalva manure is performed in certain conditions. So the principle of Valsalva test is to build positive pressure in the nasopharynx so that air enters the Eustachian tube. If the pressure in the nasopharynx increases, air will automatically be pushed into the middle ear via the Eustachian tube. So how do we perform this test? How can we increase the pressure in the nasopharynx for that? Ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold it and then pinch the nose and close the mouth and then try to exhale. Basically you are trying to push the air into the ears. There is the entire uh, pharynx is filled up with air and both the nose and the mouth are closed and you are trying to push the air out. So automatically the Eustachian tube gets opened and air will flow via the Eustachian tube into the middle ear. So if the air enters middle ear, then the tympanic membrane will move outside. It will bulge outside and you can observe this by using an otoscope. So what you do, you keep an otoscope into the external auditory canal and be ready and then ask the patient to do this. And if you observe the tympanic membrane bulging outside, it is an indication that the eustachian tube is patent and it is able to open and push the air from the nasopharynx into the middle ear. So this is Valsalva test. Now if at all there is tympanic membrane perforation, then what happens? The air that is pushed into the middle ear will also come out of that perforation into the external auditory canal and you can hear a hissing sound. That sound of air coming out will be heard. If at all there is some discharge or fluid in the middle ear, then a cracking sound will be heard. So let us Write all this down. First, the principle of Valsalva test. What is the principle? It is to build high pressure in the nasopharynx so that air is pushed into the middle ear via the Eustachian tube. It is very important that you understand this principle properly because the next few tests are also based on this principle only. In Valsalva, we are making the patient himself increase the pressure by holding the breath and trying to blow out into the ears. And in the upcoming tests, we do some other ways to achieve the same goal. So please understand the principle properly. And the result of this test would be either you will see that the tympanic membrane moves outside via an otoscope you can see this. This indicates that Eustachian tube is patent. It is opening. Next, you can see a hissing sound coming if the tympanic membrane is perforated. Via the perforation, the air comes outside. A hissing sound is heard if there is tympanic membrane perforation. Next, a cracking sound is heard if at all there is some discharge in the middle ear if there is discharge. But even if a hissing sound or a cracking sound is heard, it is understood that the tube is open. 
only so you are able to observe these findings now when will these findings not occur while salva test fails when does it fail in two conditions one is the tube is blocked if the tube is blocked obviously how much ever if you increase the pressure also the air will not be transmitted into the middle ear if the tube is blocked next only 65% of people can successfully perform this test now it sounds simple to hold the breath and to blow it into the middle ears but it is not always easy for the patient to understand your instructions and to successfully implement them and be able to perform valsalva there might be some uh, children or uh, certain uh, you know aged people who cannot exactly follow instructions or for whatever reasons or sometimes the patient is in pain ear pain or something and is not interested uh, to perform something uh, that sounds difficult so for whatever reasons only 65% of the people can successfully perform this test the other 35% in spite of the eustachian tube being patent cannot give you positive results of valsalva okay so if valsalva is negative it doesn't mean that the tube is blocked it is possible that the tube is blocked it is possible that the patient failed to perform the test okay next let us look into the contraindications of valsalva can you ask anybody and everybody to perform this test no there are some contraindications what are the contraindications if at all there is an atrophic scar of tympanic membrane now when the tympanic membrane is healing the third layer the middle fibrous layer is not formed there are only two layers so it is weak and when there is an atrophic scar and you are uh, pushing this air with such force it's possible that the scar might perforate again and the tympanic membrane might perforate again so when there is an atrophic scar of tympanic membrane avoid performing this test next if there are any infections of the nose or nasopharynx also please avoid this test otherwise you would propel that infection into the middle ear as such the patient is already having rhinitis or pharyngitis and you would cause otitis media also by performing this test because the secretions those infective secretions will come into the middle ear and cause infection there so it's absolutely contraindicated to perform this test in anybody who's suffering from infections of nose and nasal pharynx this is one important contraindication this is about valsalva test now let us look into the next test that is pollitzer test the principle of pollitzer test is also similar to valsalva test there is the same principle to build high pressure in the nasopharynx so that air is transmitted into the middle ear but as i told you 35% of the population cannot perform valsalva they cannot bring about that high pressure in the nasopharynx by themselves so what do we do for them we do pollitzer test we bring about a high pressure in the nasopharynx how there is an instrument called as pollitzer bag it has a process and a tip now the tip of that instrument is introduced into the nostril of the patient If I want to check the right eustachian tube I will close the left nostril put this tip into the right nostril and then there is a bag it's like a, a you know an ambu bag or a balloon where you can compress and cause air to go inside that is a pol pollitzer bag so then what you do you compress the bag and ask the patient to swallow now when the patient swallows the nose nostril one nostril is closed and the other nostril you have introduced the tip and you are sealing the oropharynx also so automatically high pressure is built up and also second point when the patient swallows the eustachian tube opens so with these two reasons high pressure is built up and the eustachian tube opens 
the air moves into the middle ear. This is the concept of Pulitzer test. If the patient is not able to swallow, you can ask the patient to sip water. Although it, uh, it is slightly clumsy, on one side you're performing the test and on the other side patient is drinking water, it's not so feasible. But in case the patient is not able to swallow just like that, you can ask him to swip, sip some water. Otherwise, another method to swallow is, there are some words such as saying, you know, ik, ik. All those things will cause a movement that is similar to swallowing. You can do any of these things and basically seal the oropharynx. That is the idea. So this is Pulitzer test. And now air has come into the middle ear. What we do is we take an auscultation tube. An auscultation tube is something like a stethoscope. And put it into the external auditory canal and hear the hissing sound coming from the ear of the patient. When will sound come? When air has moved into the middle ear. And the test is positive. That is, eustachian tube is patent. So let me write all this for you. The principle of Pulitzer test is same as Valsalva. We use a Pulitzer bag. The tip of the instrument is introduced into the nostril of the patient. And the patient is asked to swallow. Then with the help of an auscultation tube that is put in the ear of the patient, you will hear hissing sounds. Now hissing sound, if it is heard in Valsalva, it means that the tympanic membrane is perforated because there you are not using any stethoscope or anything to amplify the sound. You are just seeing it with an otoscope. But here you are using an auscultation tube that amplifies the sound. So even normal air NT will give you that hissing sound. Hissing sound does not mean that the tympanic membrane is perforated in Pulitzer test. Uh, so, instead of using a Pulitzer bag, even compressed air can be used, okay. This test has one use also, it will automatically ventilate the middle ear. If at all the patient is having some problems with ventilation of middle ear, ear this test is not just diagnostic, it is therapeutic also. So, there are two advantages of Pulitzer test over Valsalva. One is that you can test each eustachian tube separate. In Valsalva, the patient tries to blow air into the middle ears. And air goes into both the eustachian tubes and both the middle ears. You cannot control as to which side eustachian tube you want to check. But in Pulitzer, we introduce this air only into one nostril and close the other nostril. So we can check both the eustachian tubes. And the second advantage is that of course the patient need not perform any complex manure. We ourselves bring about an increase in pressure. And the next test after Pulitzer is catheterization test. Catheterization test also has a similar principle. We try to bring about high pressure in the nasopharynx and see if air moves into the middle ear or not. So for catheterization, we have to anesthetize the patient if, it's an, uh, if it is a stable adult. Local anesthesia can be given, but in case of uh, children or anxious adults, we can completely sedate the patient. And then we insert a catheter and connect this catheter to a Pulitzer bag and air is insufflated. And now this air moves into the middle ear and we can check whether air has entered or not by using an auscultation tube and hearing the sounds of air entry. So catheterization might sound similar to Pulitzer test. But here we are using a full-fledged catheter and the procedure is more uh, foolproof, okay? And also it is slightly complex to insert the catheter. 
you have to insert it via the floor of the nose up to the nasopharynx and the catheter has a small hook, a, a bent uh, hook like that at, at its end. And then we try to place it towards the eustachian tube and push the air. Now assume this is the nasal cavity. It's quite huge for you to understand. I, I wonder even a dinosaur would have such huge nasal cavity. But please understand the concept, okay? And this is a catheter. As you can see, there is a bent hook like that to this catheter. So how we have to introduce the catheter is that, first, this is the direction of the catheter with the hook facing upwards. Suppose, let me move the direction to this way for better understanding. The patient is like this and this is your catheter. You slowly introduce the catheter via the floor and push it inside straight like that till the nasopharynx is reached. We just keep on pushing it straight like that. And then we rotate this 90 degrees medially, that is towards the nasal septum. 90 degrees medially, it was straight like this when we have inserted it and then we rotate it 90 degrees medially. Where is the eustachian tube? Where is the eustachian tube? It is like this. And for this nostril, it is this way. But we have moved the catheter medially. Eustachian tube is lateral. I'll tell you why we did that. Now slowly, you have to withdraw it back. Keep pulling the catheter towards yourself until it hooks onto the septum, the posterior border of septum and firmly sits there. Then you have to again rotate the tube 180 degrees. When you do that, then you will exactly be at the opening of eustachian tube. As I told you, the eustachian tube lies 1.25 centimeters behind and below the inferior turbinate. When you do this procedure from here, when you exactly rotate 180 degrees, then you will be at the opening of eustachian tube. Now this is even better than Pollitzer test because you are exactly going till the opening of eustachian tube and then instilling air. So there is no other escape route and there are high chances that the eustachian tube will open and ventilate the middle ear. Okay. So although it is based on the same principle, it's an even better procedure. I can say an advanced procedure. Now for this purpose, because it's not so simple to instill the catheter so deep up to the nasopharynx and expect the patient to lie calm like that, right? So we have to anesthetize the patient, either local anesthesia or general anesthesia if it's a child. Anesthetize the patient. And I hope you have clearly understood how to insert the catheter. Yes? Okay. Then connect a Pollitzer bag and compress it so that air is insufflated. Insert the catheter and then connect a Pollitzer bag and insufflate air. Because you are right at the opening of eustachian tube, this air will be pushed via the eustachian tube into the middle ear. And with the help of an auscultation tube, you can hear the hissing sound and confirm whether air has entered or not. This is catheterization test. Now because it is a slightly complex procedure, there are some complications that can occur with catheterization. Let us see what are those complications. First complication is you can injure the eustachian tube because you are going so close and uh, the catheter tip is not a very soft object. When you are uh, manipulating it inside the nasopharynx, it's possible that you injure the eustachian tube. Injuries to eustachian tube can occur. Next, the patient can bleed while you're doing any of this. 
The next complication is if there are any infections in the nose, you can transmit those infections into the ear. Transmission of infections. And because this is a slightly invasive procedure, it's necessary that we follow complete aseptic prophylaxis. If the catheter is prop not properly sterilized, that can also introduce infections. And finally, rupture of tympanic membrane can occur if there is an atrophic scar. If atrophic scar is present, there is a high chance of rupture. Otherwise, also sometimes if you just instill too much of air with a very high pressure, then also the tympanic membrane can perforate. Now, out of these four complications, transmission of infection and uh, rupture of tympanic membrane are actually contraindications. If at all there is some infection in the nose, in the first place, you are not supposed to perform this procedure. The contraindications I told for Valsalva stand good for all these procedures also. If at all there is an infection, do not do any of these tests. And second, if at all there is an atrophic scar on the tympanic mem membrane, then also do not do any of these tests. In spite of that, if you do, these are the complications that will occur. Okay. So these three tests are based on the same principle and I can say they are more advanced one over the other. Now next in our list is a test called as Toynbee's test. Toynbee's test. Now until here what we were doing, we were putting positive pressure, high pressure in the nasopharynx and opening the tube. So we thought let us do something different. Why should we always keep positive pressure? Let's keep negative pressure and see what happens. What is negative pressure? It is that sucking force. Okay, whenever there is negative pressure, things will get sucked. When we are inspiring, it is negative pressure. Okay, when we try to drink something with a straw, basically we are putting some negative pressure and so the fluid will move inside. That is negative pressure in simplest terms. Okay, so in Toynbee's test, we decided to use negative pressure. Now, high pressure in nasopharynx, I can say, is not very physiological. It occurs if there is some pathology or in some specific situations such as yawning, swallowing and those activities. But negative pressure commonly occurs and this is more physiological. So let us see what happens when we put in negative pressure into the nasopharynx. What you have to do for that is you have to pinch the nose and ask the patient to swallow. Then what happens air from the middle ear is drawn into the nasopharynx. Opposite direction air will travel because here a negative pressure is created. You have pinched the nose, closed the no nasal outlet. Mind you, it is not like Valsalva where you breathe in and then close the no nose. No, you just close the nose. I can say maybe after exhaling, you close the nose. And then you try to swallow. A negative pressure is created in the nasopharynx and that will draw air from the middle ear into the nasopharynx. And how can you see whether this happened or not? With an otoscope, if you observe the tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane will move inwards this time. It will move inwards. You can see that with an otoscope. And then it's considered that the eustachian tube is patent and it is open. So this is Toynbee's test. Let us write the principle. Negative pressure is created in the nasopharynx. And air moves from the middle ear into the nasopharynx. This is the principle of Toynbee's test and it is more physiological. Yes, what do we observe? After doing this test, we observe that the tympanic membrane moves inwards. We can see that with an otoscope. How do we achieve negative pressure? Ask the patient to pinch his nostrils, both the nostrils and then swallow. Automatically negative pressure will be created. 
And the advantage of Toyne Bee's test is you can do this even when there is some nasal infection. Because the secretions are not going into the middle ear, they are in fact coming from the middle ear. This is Toyne Bee's test. The next test is Tympanometry. Tympanometry was also one of the tests in the assessment of hearing. Sounds familiar? Yes, okay. So this is also called as inflation deflation test. In tympanometry what we do is, we create positive and negative pressures in the external auditory canal. This time we are not doing anything in the nasopharynx. We are creating positive and negative pressures in the external auditory canal. And how do we do that? By an instrument called as Siegel's speculum. With that you can create negative and positive pressures. And then ask the patient to swallow repeatedly. This will open the tube. And if the pressure is equalized, if the eustachian tube is able to equalize the pressure in the middle ear with that of the external pressure, then the eustachian tube is functioning. Okay? So what we do here, negative and positive pressures are created in the external auditory canal by using a Siegel's speculum and the patient is asked to swallow. Swallow repeatedly. Then what happens? Because of swallowing, the eustachian tube will open. And what is one of the functions? The first function of eustachian tube, in fact, is to balance the pressure of middle ear with that of the external environment. Because only if the pressures on both sides of the tympanic membrane are equalized, then only it facilitates normal hearing. Okay? So result, if the tube is functioning, eustachian tube is functioning, then pressure will be equalized. This is about tympanometry. Next we have radiological tests. Radiological tests. What are radiological tests? Now first and foremost, this test can be performed only in patients who are already having a pre-existing perforation of the tympanic membrane. It is not for everybody. Now when already there is a perforation in tympanic membrane, what you do is you instill some radio-opaque dye into the middle ear. And then we take series of x-rays where we can trace the movement of the dye from the middle ear into the nasopharynx. And you can see the entire eustachian tube. It is uh, just in the common principle like how we take contrast x-rays anywhere in the body. With the same principle, this test also works. But the problem is, it's not possible to instill dyes into the middle ear always. Only if there is a perforated tympanic membrane, we can instill a radio-opaque dye and observe the movement of the dye by, by taking a series of x-rays. Another use with this test is that, you can also measure the time taken for the dye to travel from the middle ear into the nasopharynx. Because you are uh, monitoring the entire process, you can measure the time also. Now this indicates the clearance function of eustachian tube. One of the function of eustachian tube was to clear the middle ear of its secretions, fluid, debris, everything. All those finally have to come into the nasopharynx. So with this test, we can also check the clearance function of eustachian tube. But because it can be performed only in uh, people with perforated tympanic membrane, it is not a very popular test and it's uh, more or less not done nowadays because instilling the dye into middle ear is also uh, not a very preferred procedure because the patient could already be having some infections or uh, you know any other things like that. Instilling a dye somehow is not preferred, okay? So this test is not very popular but still you can understand its nature and use. 
it is done in patients with a pre-existing perforation of the tympanic membrane. A radio opaque dye is instilled into the middle ear via this perforation and its movement into the nasopharynx is studied. How? By taking x-rays. That is why we are using a radio opaque dye. Now this test will also tell us about the time taken for the dye to reach the nasopharynx. And why is this important to us? Because it is indicative of the clearance function of Eustachian tube. This is about radiological test. Now on similar lines, just like the radiological test, we have two more tests. And they are saccharine test and methylene blue test. You can understand them very easily. Because they are just like the radiological test. It can be done only in people with a pre-existing tympanic membrane perforation. In saccharine test what we do is we instill saccharine solution into the middle ear. And saccharine solution is sweet in taste. So when it comes into the nasopharynx and then it trickles down into the oropharynx, the patient can feel that sweet taste. And when the patient feels that sweet taste, it is indicative that the solution has travelled via the eustachian tube and come here. So two points. One, you can understand that the tube is patent. And second, you can also measure the time taken. Just like the radiological test, you will understand after how long the solution has reached the nasopharynx. So that is saccharine test. Next is methylene blue test. In methylene blue, what you do is, you instill methylene blue. And because that is a dye, a colored solution, if you observe the pharynx of the patient, you can see that it is staining the pharyngeal wall. And when it stains the pharyngeal wall or the pharyngeal secretions appear stained, that is the time taken for the dye to travel. And that also indicates the same two things. One is that the tube is patent and second, it indicates the time taken. So that is the principle of these two tests. Very similar to radiological tests, but here we don't even use a radio opaque dye and x-rays, nothing. Very simple, just instill saccharine solution or instill methylene blue. If it is saccharine solution, the patient will have to tell you when he feels that sweet taste. And if it is methylene blue, you will have to uh, put a scope and observe the staining of pharyngeal secretions. So even these tests are not very popular for similar reasons being it can be done only in cases of a perforated tympanic membrane. Otherwise, we cannot instill anything into the middle ear. Yes? In case of saccharine test, a sweet taste is felt by the patient. After some time, and that indicates the tube is patent. And in case of methylene blue test, the pharyngeal secretions are stained and that can be seen by you. And this indicates that the tube is patent. And in both these tests, just like the radiological test, you can measure the time taken, which is indicative of clearance function. Now based on the sim, uh, same principle, there is another concept where if you instill ear drops in patients who have a tympanic membrane perforation, they also complain of some bad taste in the throat. Now it is generally not done on purpose. Sometimes patients themselves instill certain drops into their ears 
not knowing that they have a perforation and then they later experience some sort of bad taste in the mouth. Why does that happen? Because there is a eustachian tube connecting the middle ear and the nasopharynx and that tube is also patent. So this bad taste is observed in the mouth because first it comes into the nasopharynx and then it trickles down into the oropharynx. So that way also it's not exactly a test, I can say it's just an observation, okay. And now coming to the last test that is sonotubometry. Sonotubometry. What is sonotubometry? Sono means sound. So we are using something related to sound in this test. Let us see what it is. Okay. Sound is presented to the nose and its recording is taken from the external canal. Why the sound that is presented to the nose will go into the nasopharynx and then via the eustachian tube it will go into the middle ear and it can be recorded in the external auditory canal. All this will happen if the tube is patent. Okay. If the tube is patent, what happens is the sound will be heard louder actually. Now the advantage with this procedure is it is absolutely non-invasive. Just the sound is presented to the nose. But it's not a very well-developed procedure because there are some accessory sounds, even the breath sounds in the nose, they can all interfere with the test results. So it's not a completely developed test. But this is the concept that can be used. Okay. So in sonotubometry what we do is, a tone what is a tone sound of a single frequency it's a pure tone yes that is presented to the nose and it is heard in the external auditory canal and the sound will be loud if the tube is patent okay and uh, the advantage is it is a non-invasive technique it's a non-invasive procedure so with this we complete the eustachian tube function tests let me quickly revise them all for you First three tests, Valsalva, Pollitzer test and catheterization are based on the same principle. That is, we bring about high pressure in the nasopharynx and see if the air travels via the eustachian tube into the middle ear. This checks the patency of the eustachian tube. The next test, Toynbee's test, creates a negative pressure in the nasopharynx so that air moves in the reverse direction from the middle ear into the nasopharynx. We can observe this by seeing an inward movement of the tympanic membrane. The next we have some less important tests such as radiological tests, saccharine test and methylene blue solution installation test. In these uh, tests can be done only when there is a perforated tympanic membrane. In radiological test we instill a radio opaque dye and observe its movement. In methylene blue we see staining of pharyngeal secretions. In saccharine solution test, the patient will himself tell you that he is able to feel some sweet taste in his mouth. And then there is tympanometry. In tympanometry, also called as inflation deflation test, we are bringing about positive and negative pressures in the external auditory canal and we are observing if the eustachian tube is able to perform its function of equalizing the pressure or not. That is tympanometry. And finally, we have sonotubometry where sound is given to the nose and heard via the external auditory canal and it is heard louder if the eustachian tube is patent. With this I complete the function tests of eustachian tube. Thank you very much.